Woo! Now that's some serious thrust. This is an MHD drive, or a Magneto Hydrodynamic Thruster. Bit of a mouthful, but also a remarkably exotic way to create underwater thrust. Look, propellers and engines are great at producing thrust, but they're also great at producing noise. And marine animals, they don't like that. MHD thrusters, on the other hand, they have the potential to be totally silent because they don't have any moving parts. In fact, the only thing that moves is the water. Instead, they capitalize on a rivalry between magnetism and electricity in order to create thrust. Woo! They've been popularized by Hollywood and then put into actual practice by the Yamada One boat over in Japan. So I set out to build the most compact, powerful thruster I possibly could. This video is sponsored by Keysight Technologies, who are giving away over 100K worth of lab equipment during their Live from the Lab event. I'd heard of Magneto Hydrodynamic Thrust before. It sounded super sci-fi and interesting, but <laughs> never really gave it much thought. Until I put out my last video about an ionic thrust catamaran. You guys bombed the comments section requesting I dig into this, so I geared up for an underwater thruster. Funny thing is, MHD thrust and ionic thrust are essentially cousins. While ionic thrust works best accelerating gases, and it does an amazing job, MHD thrust works best with water, but they both rely on electrified mediums in order to create thrust. You may have heard of MHD drives before if you've watched The Hunt for Red October. In an attempt to be stealthy and hide from a US submarine, they activate their Caterpillar drive, which has no moving parts and is totally silent. It's an MHD drive. In their simplest form, they use two electrodes and a magnet. When the electrodes are placed in salt water, with one attached to positive and the other to negative, and a sufficient voltage is applied between them, the water undergoes electrolysis. But that's about it. However, when a properly oriented magnet is placed between the electrodes, that all changes. This time when sufficient voltage is applied, something incredible happens. The water begins to move in one dedicated direction, and that flow of water can be very noticeable. And why this happens is beautifully simple. With the water electrified, a horizontal electric field is present between the electrodes. On the other hand, the magnet's magnetic field is oriented vertically. When a magnetic field interacts with an electric field that is oriented perpendicularly, the electric charge carriers experience a force in the Z direction. That is called a Lorentz force. And in this case, what are the charge carriers? The electrified water. This is also how a railgun works. So, movement of water with no moving parts and virtually no noise signature. It's a super epic idea, and it seems simple enough. But since I was going to build this into a thruster topography, there were a lot of variables that I had to consider. So, that's where I started. Here's the variables to consider, each one of them affecting the output of this thruster. We've got electrode spacing, surface area of electrodes, magnetic field strength, and a little known thing called voltage. I'll run through all the variables one at a time until I can find patterns that work. Testing these individually would create really clear data I could draw from for the final design, so I started with electrode spacing. For the magnetic component, I searched for strong neodymium magnets that were linear in design. There were lots of options, and I figured waterproof types would probably perform best. While I waited for those to arrive, I got to work designing a test platform that could be used for all the variables. The result was pretty straightforward, so I hit print. With my Prusa laboring away, I took a quick trip to my local scientific supplier, often mistaken for a home improvement store, Plasma Depot. They have a cute little section dedicated to electrodes, which I promptly brought home and sliced into the necessary lengths. For these spacing tests, I'll use 12 volts and 8 centimeter long electrodes as a standard. The underside of the test rig is where I placed a magnet, and first up was an electrode spacing of 5 centimeters. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's so cool. I then moved them closer to 3 centimeters. Amazing. I can't tell if that's faster. Ultimately, I tested two to five centimeter spacing and was a bit shocked to see no measurable effect on velocity. 
Closer electrode spacing increases the current draw, which leads to stronger electromagnetic fields, which are then repelled away by the magnet. So closer spacing should lead to higher velocities. My data didn't show that. I don't know what's going on. Leave your thoughts down below. More accurately, I want to test length of travel. So both the magnetic field and the electrodes will be varied between 8, 10, 12, and 14 centimeters with a standardized spacing of 3 centimeters. Now from the last test, we know the results of an 8 centimeter long electrode. So I'm going to start with 10 centimeters. Not a big difference. All right, longest one. Let's see what happens. Ah, oh, unbelievable. No, that's faster. Oh, that's totally faster. The electrode length seemed to have a clear effect on velocity with longer electrodes equating to higher velocities. This next test, really straightforward. We already know the velocities produced by an eight centimeter electrode spaced three centimeters apart with a magnet placed underneath of it. So I'm gonna double up the magnetic field strength by placing a magnet on top of the electrodes in the same orientation. Let's see. Oh, oh, oh. hell yeah. Woo! Look at that, that's a massive jump. That is a massive jump. I tested one, two, three, and four magnets which indicated a positive correlation between magnetic field strength and velocity. The magnetic field strength data was fairly predictable considering external magnetic fields are the force that causes repulsion in the first place. So increasing the strength of that repulsion leads to faster velocities. For this last test, voltages of 5, 10, 15, and 20 were applied, which indicated another positive correlation between voltage and water velocity. In summary, all the variables showed a positive correlation with water velocity, except electrode spacing. What a rebel. Ultimately, these tests provided a clear picture of how to build my thruster. Stronger magnets, higher voltages, and longer electrodes will lead to faster velocities out. I'm gonna take a leap of faith and assume that all the variables combined will be good. Fueled with data, I set out to build the best MHD thruster I could. Starting with 3D design, I hopped on Onshape to model the intake and output sections. I like Onshape because it's really intuitive and designed for pretty much anybody. Engineers, inventors, YouTubers, you name it. And what's really nice is the sharing function because it makes collaborative team design a total cinch. Which for example, Daniel and I used for designing the Ionic Thrust boat. I'll leave a link in the description. And with that, the thruster is totally complete. You can see there's three super strong neodymium magnets, and these all work in conjunction to accelerate water through two identical inputs into one unified output. <laughs> I'm really curious to see what the hell this thing can do. Uh, so I think it's time to dunk it in some salt water. And after you've seen the thruster in action, you have got to check out the event that Keysight Technologies is throwing. On September 12th is Keysight World live from the lab. It's a free live stream for engineers and techies such as yourself and will take you inside electric vehicle test labs to explore the tech behind high power charging, batteries, and how EVs might actually fuel the grid. And let's be honest, battery tech, aka energy density tech, kind of the new frontier. You also have a chance to win a 6 GHz 8-channel oscilloscope and other pro-grade test gear. They do these events several times per year and past events are recorded on their site. If you sign up using my link in the description, Keysight will give you an extra bonus entry into the giveaway. I've proudly promoted this event before because it's all about sharing a passion, which quite frankly, I can get behind. And on that note, let's see how the thruster does. For these tests, I required a much bigger container. Being careful to mix 35 grams of salt per liter, which is typical ocean salinity, I prepared the thruster for its first functional test. I was really hopeful. 
I'm amped for these tests because the magnets used here are on a magnitude of strength way higher than what I had during the test platform. And then also, this is a double decker combined into one output compared to the single decker of the test. So let's rip loose and see what the hell this thing can do. First up was 12 volts. We've got bubbles. Ooh, yeah. Oh, that velocity is way higher. Woo! Oh, ho, 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 ho. This was really exciting, so I bumped it up to 15 volts. Oh, look at that. Way higher velocity and like a lot more volume too. And for a full send, I pushed it to 25 volts. Woo! Now that's some serious thrust. <laughs> Lastly, I was curious how orientation affected performance. This was really interesting. Whoa, what the hell is this? Oh, but it looks pretty cool. I think that's the electrodes kind of dissolving. So, what are the final numbers? Well, at maximum operating voltage of 25 volts and 9 amps, this little thruster produces 75 grams of thrust. That's 3 watts per gram, which <laughs> for a first prototype, I'm really pleased with. And I'm gonna refine this design further, maybe upscale it, put it on a full-size boat or submarine. I don't know, it's a crazy world out there. This design is a good starting point, and being entirely held together with magnetism makes disassembling it for repairs super easy. It all just comes right apart. You might have noticed I use brass for the electrodes as well. This is because electrolysis causes an oxide layer to build up on the electrodes, which can be resistive. The oxide layer on brass is still quite conductive, so brass maintains performance over time. Woo! Make sure to check out Keysight World live from the lab if you want to win free equipment. And a massive thank you to all my Patreons who patiently wait for my sparse videos and to everybody at home that supports science. Just never forget the power of human innovation. And with that, you stay classy.